Good evening, everybody. Shall we all stand? We're going to worship the Lord together. Amen. Sing together, we worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened, He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds a victory. Come on, let's declare together. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise, Lord. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Come on, we sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes the way. Because he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be crying. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be crying. We shout out your praise. Come on, we shout out. We shout out your praise. Lord, we shout out your praise, Lord. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisons, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the hearts of the Lord sing. Come on, with one voice we say, We were the beggars. Now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, there's joy, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be crying, we shout this joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Lord, we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Come on, let's make a shout of praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise, oh God. For you are worthy, Lord. Yes, you are worthy of all praise. Thanks, guys. What a great start. We praise our Lord. You know, once we were beggars, but now we're not. We're in the presence of a living God. We're part of the children of the house of God. Isn't that such a wonderful, wonderful privilege to be called children of a living God? And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for you and me, that we might know that freedom, we might walk in that freedom, that we might know we have a purpose and that we can make a difference in our society, in our community. And that's what we're about tonight. You know, we've got a great speaker with us. 
And I've got to stop joking, apparently. <laughs> no, he is a great speaker, honest. I'm going to be really careful. When I finish this introduction, I'm moving into the back, out of the way of anything he can throw at me, any chalk or anything he can find like the school teacher. But it's great to have you with us again, Mark. Absolutely fantastic to be with us, following last week. Just be, as Mark comes up to share, I just want to reaffirm us what we're doing tonight as part of our vision and our stretching and our exercising and being confident in sharing our faith. It's important to the vision of the church to reach this community because this community is going to grow and be touched by the people that are the church because the church has got legs, it's got arms. This building can't go anywhere but the people can. And it can be in all the places all the time, in every situation. And this is the promise, remember, God's given us. Because we've got no children's work at the moment, we're a growing church. But God says, as he said to the Israelite nation, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispose nations and settle in the cities. We are growing as a vision of God. We're not going to build our empire. We're not trying to build something of a kingdom for ourselves. We want to build a kingdom for the glory of God. But moreover than that, even more important than that, I want people to encounter God, to know the freedom and walk in it, and to know they have a purpose in God, and that they can make a difference in this community. And this is what we're about tonight. And, and Mark gave us some fantastic insight into that last week. And I know he's going to do the same again this week. And joking aside, but great to see you. Great to be with you. Great to be on this journey with you. Give him a round of applause as he comes to share with us. Bless you, man. Thank you. So good to see you. Thanks for coming. For those of you that have come back, I mean, wow, you knew what you were going to get and you still came back. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, this is my friend James. I've brought a friend. Yes, yeah, so everyone say hi, James. Yeah, hi, James. Good. That's good. Yeah, no, don't get him to speak, whatever you do. I heard him. No. Um, so it's brilliant to be here. And um, I'm excited because I, I was praying about, you know, the, the chance to be here. Um, I wanted to tell you about this thing. Um, one of my mates back in Nottingham, he uh, um, came to me and he's a bit embarrassed, a little bit embarrassed because he says, oh, Mark, he says, um, you know, I'm an adult and I, I can't swim. He goes, I, I didn't get taught to how to swim as a kid and I can't swim. And so he says, well, I, I'm, what do you think I should do? So I chatted to him and I said, listen, you, you know, you should go for lessons. Go for lessons, mate. Even though he says, oh, it'll be terrible doing lessons. Everyone else will be kids and it'll be just me. And I'm like, that's fine, do it. So I really urged him to do it. And after the first couple of lessons, he, he, uh, <laughs> he got in touch with me and said, Mark, it's terrible. Everybody's a kid. I'm the only adult there. And I've got to jump in. We've all got to grab the floats. And the kids are all there. And it's me. He says, but I, I, I'm trying. He says, but I, I'm not good. And he's like, I, I'm really struggling. And then I never heard much after that. And then unbelievably, unbelievably, I saw him on telly. He was on the news. And what had happened is, is he had jumped in. A guy had fallen into the Trent and he was there and he actually jumped into the Trent and got out to this guy and managed to kind of keep him up before they brought a rescue boat who went and saved him. So when I saw this like on the news, I like called him. I'm like, mate, what happened? The last time I spoke to you, you were having swimming lessons with kids. Now you're like saving people in the trend. What happened? And he says, no, he says, you've got to understand. He says, I'm still a terrible swimmer. I can't really swim. He says, but. I says, well, if you can't really swim, what happened? And he said this really key phrase. He goes, Mark, he says, I suddenly realized that the need was greater than my inadequacies. The need was greater than my inadequacies. In other words, he realized that even though he was totally inadequate, the guy was drowning in the river and he needed to get in and save him, even though he felt totally inadequate. And you know, as we're here today and we're going to be chatting about evangelism, 
probably a lot of us feel a little bit inadequate. We feel like, oh, I'm not sure how good I am at this. But what we were chatting about last week is the need is absolutely tremendous, isn't it? People need the Lord. Amen. People need Jesus. And they need to be rescued. And so I really have that thing burning inside of us that our inadequacies would just pale into insignificance because actually seeing people rescued is like the main, the main thing. So if let's just quickly grab this. Do you remember we were chatting about Acts chapter, uh, we were looking at Acts chapter 26 when Paul was there in front of Agrippa. And, and in Acts chapter 26, um, in verse 27, uh, Acts 26, verse 27, King Agrippa said, Do you believe the purpose I, be I believe? He says, And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. And I was chatting last week about some people are on a short journey and some people are on a long journey. That we all know people that like all they are is just an invite away. You invite them to come, they come to church, they get saved in the worship, they're there. It's great. But we all know that there are some people who are on a long journey. You've probably been chatting to some people for a long time about Jesus, invited them to church lots of times, and they're still not here. And I want to encourage you today. So I wanted to give us some tips on people who are on a long journey. The first thing I wanted to talk about is so important that we listen. We listen to people. We must be willing to listen to the needs and thoughts of the non-Christian, if we want people to hear us, we must hear them. If we want people to hear us, we must hear them. I don't know if you've ever met those kind of Christians who are just, they call themselves evangelists, but they're basically just those people that just chat, 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 chat. Jesus is the answer. Um, I don't know what the question is, but Jesus is the answer. And it's like they're really like, and they're just jumping and they're telling everybody about Jesus. Listen, the first protocol is that we need to listen to people, don't we? We need to understand where people are coming from, what their hearts are, what their aches are, what's going on in their life. You know, it would be great for you as an evangelist, as somebody who's trying to win someone for the Lord, to go for a coffee with someone and just sit and listen to them. Listen to all their stuff. Listen to everything that's going on in their life. And maybe not even mention Jesus once, but just listen to them. Because it is so incredibly important that people feel like they've been heard. And yet sometimes we are so quick to jump in with Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, actually, we want to take a step back and say, let me hear you. Let me listen to you. Let me see you. What is, what's going on with you? What is happening in your life? So I wanted to say that one of the great things that we must get into it is we must learn to ask great questions. To ask great questions. I love this quote. Many are cynical and skeptical against anything religious. People are skeptical of anyone who claims to have life-changing answers. I mean, you guys are a bit like that as well. You know when somebody at the bus stop's telling you that they've got all the answers to the world, you're a bit like, whoa, aren't you? As soon as anybody feels like they've got all the answers, you give them that, whoa, hold on. But everyone will entertain caring and intelligent questions. If we ask good questions, people will relate to us. They'll connect with us because people are interested in getting their story out there. And so we must become those people that listen and we ask fantastic questions. So I'm wanting you to think about open-ended, open-hearted questions. So what do I mean by open-ended? 
a million questions that do not allow people to say yes or no to. You know when you're in a chat with someone and they just, yeah, no, yeah, no. And it's like, oh, this conversation is not going fantastically well. And it's like we need to have open-ended questions that really bring the best out of people, but also open-hearted questions. So it's not, we're not trying to ask questions that are trying to trip people up. We're not trying to trick people into the kingdom of heaven. We're not trying to sort of say, oh, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go? You know, you're desperately trying to catch people out. No, 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 no. None of those things. Open-hearted questions. So if you've got a pen and a bit of paper, I've got five open-ended questions that I want to share with you. And then what I'm going to get us to do, a little bit of work today, going to keep you involved, is that before we sing again, I'm going to get us to just be in twos and threes, whatever's close, and basically come up with a great question that you think you could ask a non-Christian that would get them talking. That's like an open ended open-hearted question yeah we'll come to that in a minute so here's number one here's the first one i've got i've got five for you yeah here's the first one if you could ask god any three questions what would they be that's a good thing to ask if you could ask god any three questions what would they be that's a good, the reason why that's a good question is because as soon as they start to relay what they would ask God, it really shows you where they're up to in their relationship with God. Does that make sense? They begin to like relay to you, oh, I would ask God, why is there suffering? Or I would ask God, you know, why did my baby die? Or I would ask, God, do, do you see what I'm saying? Immediately, they would begin to express where they're at. Now, somebody said to me, what if they say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, great. That, at least that's helpful and you know kind of what you're dealing with. So it's a great question. Here's a second one if you've got a pen. Have you ever been able to get a handle on what you think your purpose in life is? Have you ever been able to get a handle on what you think your purpose in life is? Wow, that's a great question to ask a known Christian and get them chatting. When they start talking about like, oh, this is kind of like what I think, this is what I believe, this is what I think I'm on the planet for, and you begin to understand their passion, and you begin to understand how they tick, and it's a really great way of starting a conversation. Does that make sense? Here's number three. If God was your neighbor, if God was your neighbor, what would you bob round and ask God for? You know when you bob round to the neighbor and get some sugar or some salt or whatever you bob round for? It's like, yeah, you, you can only ask for certain things. You can't bob round for steak, can you? That causes, that causes an issue. It's like, have you got any steak in the fridge I can borrow? Um, but if God was your neighbor, what would you bob round and ask God for? And it's interesting, isn't it? Like, what would you ask God for? And interesting to see how they would respond to that. Here's number four. What scares you the most about letting God change your life? What scares you the most about letting God change your life? I think that is fascinating because it's like, what is stopping you from having a relationship with God? And they begin to talk. And here's the fifth and the final one for now. What would God have to be like for you to want to know him? What would God have to be like for you to want to know him? And I think this is brilliant as well because, you know, they begin to say, well, if God was kind, then I would be happy to know him. And you're able to say, God is kind. The Bible's full of the kindness of God. Or they say, oh, if God was forgiven, then I would. And you're like, but God is forgiven. And it's a great opportunity for you to say, a lot of times, the God that people rebel against is not the God of the Bible. It's the God in their own head. 
Do you get it? Because it's like they've thought of what God's really like. And it's like, no, God's not like that. You know, and they've kind of got this picture of, of who and what God is like. So if you were in Starbucks or Costa or Cafe Nero or wherever you like your coffee, we had some in that bike. Is that bike shop still there? Yeah, yeah. Well, is it, it's still there. Good. And um, it was what, say? He's, he's still moaning because he had to pay. And he's like, do you know what I mean? I'll give you the money at the end. I'll give you the money. At the, you're getting the money at the end. I'll send your check. And uh, he paid for one coffee, and he's, he's, he's phoned me every week about it. So the thing is, <laughs> she'd never have let me have the microphone. You knew that. Um, so basically, what we're thinking is, if you were to have a coffee with a known Christian, and you were just chatting, and you were going to ask an open-ended, open-hearted question that would get that person talking, what would that question be? So what I want you to do is just to be in twos and threes just for a few minutes and come up with a question. Using the ones that I've given you as kind of examples as like, you know, th this is the kind of thing. Now, don't I, I put this to one group and somebody says, do you think the world's flat? That was the question that they wanted to ask. No, we don't want to get people down the, like, the conspiracy theory route, do we? We've got to think of where it's going to end. Where will this question take people, yeah? So probably asking them, do you believe in UFOs is not a good question, yeah? Don't take them away down weird paths. So let's just do this for five minutes. An open-ended, open-hearted question that you could ask your friend, somebody that you're kind of just journeying with, a question. Let's do that now, yeah? Just in the twos and threes around you, let's do it. Yeah, good. So I'm sorry. Thank you for the coffee. <laughs> well, you didn't hear what I said, thanks. Okay, just one minute then, and then we've got a little bit of feedback to see if anybody's come up with anything, any good ones. Right. 
Good, good, good. Okay, well, let's see if we've got any um, any suggestions. Um, what about what about this? Like these guys here, right? The uh, yeah, because and Mark, you're a very intelligent guy. So, <laughs> wow, wow. I know that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. That is good. So that was, he said, um, we've all got questions about life. What would, your, what would yours be if, if you came face to face with God? That is, that's a great question because that really gets to the, uh, Oh, there's people over here saying that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, the old classic. Oh, that, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. Oh, the family. Uh, keep it in the family. I like that. Have you guys got something similar to that? Brilliant. Love that. What about you guys? What did you have? Brilliant. Guys, you've, these are good. No, honestly, I went to one place and I set this exercise and it was an absolute nightmare because people were like, what do, do you think Elvis is still alive? And things like that. It was like... I thought, oh my goodness, what am I doing? But these are good questions. <laughs> By the way, Elvis is still alive, because I saw him in Morrison's. <laughs> so just in case anyone's in case anyone's wondering. What were you in that group? What about you want this is gonna be good. This is gonna be very deep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, he's opening it right up now, isn't he? It would be um, probably just a pleasure to just lie down and rest. Not necessarily what puts you off going to church. What puts you off going to church? Yeah, oh, good. Yeah. No, I like that. That is good. I mean, obviously, you'd have to be ready for them just to be like, it's totally boring. But you'd be ready for that. Yeah. No, good, good. Oh, so you, that's that. It's like, I'm an atheist. What does God think? Oh, wow. That, that would be, that would set the cat right amongst the pigeons there, all right? I like it, though. I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. Anyone over here, what did you guys have? Oh, wow. That is good. That is good. I like that. That's really good, like open-ended, open-hearted question. Brilliant, yeah, yeah. What about the guys behind? What did you come up with? You did? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 interesting. Anyone else got any, any others that they want to? Yeah, yeah, at the back there. I do. I have actually heard him. Right. Wow. Oh, wow. I mean, it would definitely open up a very interesting conversation. Yeah. I mean, how you would get it round to God and the kind of, that would be a challenge. But no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Good. Yep. Back row. The back. The back row, ladies. What have you got? <laughs> Go on. Ah. Good. Good. I like that because it really is like stating it as clear, as straight as you can. I go to church. What do you think about church? I like it. Yeah. So uh, what I've enjoyed about um, your answers has been that all of them are kind of 
definitely going to open people up and kind of like get people talking. And that's like the whole nature of the thing is to try and get people having a conversation. And then when we're getting them talking, you know, like some of those questions that were asked, you could really understand how that they would then begin to like, oh, okay, I can put another view over to you in quite an easy and simple way. And also I can understand a little bit about what your story is because you're you're communicating. So we're listening, but we're also steering the conversation in a really, really good way. So like a little challenge that I've been setting myself recently is, you know, how about thinking like, could I sit down with a few questions like that with somebody and have a coffee with them and just kind of ask them a few questions and just steer the conversation? What we're going to do in a minute is we're going to sing a song, but after we've sung the song, we're, I'm going to do a little bit just around telling our story and how we shape our story. Because you see, our story is the most powerful thing that we've got that we can really communicate to other people. And I want to kind of, I remember um, seeing this thing, cow, my, my brother and me used to be really into a cowboy and Indian films. You remember the cowboy and Indian films? And basically, I um, remember that this um, one scene where basically the, cow, the cowboy guy had gone out and the lady was in the house on her own. And these, these bad men came into the house and she panicked and she ran and she got the rifle from the rifle cupboard, all the guns. And basically, she'd never used it before. So she had this weapon that was powerful and strong, but she'd never used it before. And then when they came in the room, I'll never forget it, she like started firing, but because she'd never used it, she was shooting up into the roof and she was shooting all over the place. And because she'd got this weapon, but she'd never ever learned how to use it properly. And you know, we've got, this powerful weapon, and our story is the most powerful thing we've got. And yet, if we're honest, a lot of us, we've not really learned how to use it properly. You know, if, if there were some non-Christians that came in today and you were give, had the opportunity just to share your story, you know, would it be a bit rusty? Would there be bits of it that you would be like kind of waffling, sort of saying stuff that you know, like, oh, what's that got to do with anything? Or would you kind of be able to do it in two minutes? Imagine if I said I want you to share your story, how you came to faith in two minutes. Would you be able to do it? So we're going to kind of do a little bit of work around that. So guys, if you don't mind, we'll just sing a song and then we'll, we'll crack into that. That'd be great. Praise God. Should we stand? We're going to worship the Lord. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of this song Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I raise the Hallelujah 
great stuff. Thanks, band. Um, so in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 14 to 16, um, it says something like really, really good. It says, um, <laughs> I can hear myself speaking. Um, it says, Matthew 5, 14, 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, guys, we are the light of the world. We are those that bring light. And what I find incredible about this is that when you think about light, lots of Christians, when it comes to evangelist, evangelism, just think about the spotlight in people's face, that blaring light where it's like, you know, wow, and it's dazzling, and it's overpowering, and it's like, oh, my goodness. And for such a long time, that was kind of like the evangelist was like the light that just gets in everybody's eyes. And basically everybody wants to back off from because they're just too much. But the incredible thing about light is that light can be really nuanced. Lighting can be really beautiful. You know, companies pay millions of pounds to get the light in just right. And we as a church have got to learn that like when it comes to evangelism, we've got to be nuanced. We've got to be multi-layered. We've got to be different. It's not just about that blasting. Now, those of you that know me know that there are times when I really am that light in people's eyes. I am like, Jesus died on the cross for you. You need to get saved today. If you don't get saved today, you might go from this place and you'll never get another chance. I'm that guy. Um, just before Christmas, I think I told you last week, but 247 people made a first-time response to Jesus at that event. So I believe in full-on, in-your-face evangelism, but I also believe in the nuanced sense that sometimes the most powerful evangelism is just you putting your hand on someone else's hand and saying, I'm here for you, I care for you. And it's just being the grace of Jesus. And it's just being the light in a completely different way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that it doesn't all have to be the same kind of light all the time. We don't all want to go from here and get sandwich boards made and go out into town and kind of be like, you know, you're all going to die. Here's the good news. You're all going to hell. Do you know what I mean? If that's the good news, what's the bad news? It's like, you know... We've got to realize that light can come in many different ways. That we, you know, the event that I'm going to be doing for you in April, you know, we're going to have some laughs and there's going to be a lot of humor and there's going to be a, like that opportunity for people to respond to a message. And we want to do it differently. When I'm up at the Edinburgh Fringe, I cannot be in shows shouting that everybody's going to hell because they'd kick me out. So I've got to do it in a much more nuanced way. And I really love that you guys understand that. You know, you have supported me in my ministry for a lot of years. A lot of years. And I was telling James on the way here that, you know, I'm so grateful that there are people in the church that sponsor me. The church sponsors me. And I'm so thankful. And I think that you've understood that, you know, this light that we are to be can be in many different kind of ways. It's not all about just like a revival light blasting in people's eyes. It's not just about a judgment light. So I'm really excited that we're going to get this chance in April to do this event where there's going to be food, there's going to be humor and comedy, but then there's going to be an incredible opportunity to hear a great message. So that's going to be cool. So five tips on how to tell your story. Five tips on how to tell your story. Number one, keep it as tight as you can. No waffling. Now, some people, 
There are some people that find it easy, and there are some people that find this very difficult. Try to keep it to three to four minutes. Wow, can you do that? Can you communicate any message in three to four minutes? Some people can barely tell you what they're watching on telly in three to four minutes. They've got to tell you the whole deal. No waffling. Keep it tight. Keep it really succinct. It's really good to be able to give you a message. Now, sometimes we're given a bit of grace and we get the opportunity to have 10 minutes. Or sometimes people have got a lot of grace for us and you might get a chance to tell it in half an hour. But We've got to learn the discipline of telling it in three minutes because that's exactly the kind of bite-sized message that most people have got time for. And it's like, wow, if you were in the lift with somebody from floor one to floor nine and you thought, I'm going to tell my story, could you do it in that time? Oh, great. Number two, avoid all jargon. Avoid all jargon. I think we sort of came across this a bit last week, but you know, ah, oh, I used to be in the world and now I'm a Christian. And people are like going, you're not in the, where are you? If you're not in the world, where are you? I mean, where, where, what planet are you on? And I mean, some of you have asked that question a few times. And it's like, you know, oh, I got washed in the blood of the Lamb. People are like, oh, what goes on in that church? What goes on? Have they got a big bath of blood? And it's like, oh, there's all this jargon that we can come up with. And it's so important that we speak the language of the listener. We do not use jargon. Number three, can you use a before and after model? This is what I was like before I was a Christian. And this is what I'm like after. Now, Not everybody has got, I became a Christian when I was like 12. So I've not really got, you know, I mean, I wasn't petrol sniffing before I became a Christian. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't a heroin addict before I became, I I became a Christian when I was 12. I think the worst thing I'd done was eat wine gums. You know what I mean? So, because they can be lethal. But I think if you have got a before and after story, That's a brilliant model to use. This is what it was like before. And then, wow, I met Jesus. And this is what it's like after. Don't do that thing. I don't know if, remember, like, people used to give the testimonies. We don't really do it so much in churches now, but there used to be, there was always a testimony on a Sunday night, wasn't there? And basically, there used to be these testimonies where the guys would, like, talk about their one and powerful, big, huge, terrible things that they did before they became a Christian. And then they would be like, yeah, and then I got saved. And then it was like everything after that was a bit boring. And it's like, wow. And it's like it's like a hell's angel party animal. Then, then I became a Christian and I bought a suit and I go to church. It's like, no, 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 no. We've got to like relay this and communicate in a good way. And it's like, Can I talk about what happened before? Can I talk about what happened after? And, you know, have you got a story that you could tell? Here's, if, if you maybe can't use the before and after model, number four would be, can you use a personal story? So my before and after story doesn't really work. I was 12, I got saved, and I've never really rebelled against my faith, and that, great, great. So I don't really tend to use that. What I use is my own little personal story that I've got. And then you come across these all the time. So I just tell, if I was in the lift, I wouldn't say, oh, before I became a Christian, this is what happened. And then I got saved. And then this is what happened. Because that doesn't work for me, that one. So what I would do is I tell a little story about when I went to Africa. And basically, I went to Africa and we were having these outdoor camping experience. And we went and we got wood. And I talked about how I got the driver, the truck driver, to drive the lorry as fast as he could. And he got over 100 miles an hour. And he was throwing the truck around. And it was amazing. But then we went and chained up this big, huge dead tree. And we were driving back to camp. And now it was dragging this heavy weight behind it. And now it couldn't get to any of the heights and the speeds that it got to before. 
because it's dragging this weight behind it. But when we got to camp, we cut the chain and then the truck was able to go as fast as it could. And I would tell that story and some of you already could understand what I'm saying. I would then say, you know, that's like a lot of us. God designed us to be incredible and wonderful and amazing. But in our life, we drag the stuff behind us. And the Bible calls it sin, the rubbish of our life, the stuff of our life. And now we're dragging it behind us. And now we're not able to be everything God created us to be. But you know what? Jesus came, died on the cross so that that chain could be cut off and we could leave all the baggage behind and we could live in the fullness of what God's got for us. And that is kind of like how I would tell my story. Do you see what I mean? And that, like, that's not a before and after model, but it's a little thing that's happened to me that I'm able to relay and get the gospel message. So maybe you could find a little story. And that doesn't have to be like an African truck experience. It could be, wow, picking up a bag of crisps at Blidder. I mean, it could be anything. It could be whatever. I don't know how you would get that into the gospel, but I'm sure I'll leave that with you. But, you know, whatever you, you can find, whatever is a good picture of using the message of the gospel. Tell your story. Amazing. Number five, add an element of urgency. An element of urgency. I like to tell it, and I like to like leave people at that point of like, you know, this is important. You need to make a decision on this. This is not just... Because you see, sometimes when we tell it, we leave it in such a way that people are like, oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. That's great for you, and I've got me, and that's great, and that, well, let's all just be happy together. I tried to tell my story with a little bit of urgency that's like, wow, Jesus is asking you today. You know, when Jesus is stand at the door and knock, and is, are you going to answer that, or are you going to, what are you going to do? Are you going to accept, or are you going to reject? Now, not every single time, but there are times when we've got to bring that little element of urgency into it. And it's really, really important. So I wondered if we could have a little go back in those groups that we were in before. And I wonder if you could designate one person who would be brave enough to share their story in maybe two or three minutes. And the rest of you are looking out and listening are they using jargon? Are they are they waffling? Yeah, they're you know are they saying oh I, now it was a Friday because Friday's fish day no or was it a Wednesday because that's when we have pies you know what I mean if anybody's waffling then you've got the freedom to no I'm not going to say that because we'll end up with an injury um, you know well, well well let's see so get into those groups that we were in before one person that's brave. Share the story for two to three minutes and see if they can do it. No jargon and keep it nice and tight. Amen? Let's go. Let's do it.
Good. Great stuff. Great. Amen. Ah, 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 um, amen. Great. Good. Did um, how did people find that experience? Did they um, do you find it hard? Yeah, yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? It's like that thing that with a gun, you've got to like we've got to practice a few times, don't we? And get get it like kind of working and get it ship shape. I I know like I even still struggle with the jargon bit because it's dead easy to slip into it, isn't it? And just kind of say, who who was telling the story over here was, ah, great. And Max, Max did, yeah. <laughs> and how did it, did he do good? good. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to explain. I've got like there's two different versions of that. So I've been I've been at it two and a half hours. I was in Princeton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That morning for a few hours. Well, not just that. It's also they're both interesting. But like I was, I was talking to someone this morning about it. And yeah. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. No, 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 it's true. I thought when you said two two completely different stories, <laughs> change my name and everything, so that would be brilliant. It's like, to the Christians, I'm Jack, and to the, to the non christians I'm Tony. But no, I, li- I like that. I think, I think um, the, the jargon's a little bit um, difficult. If people find about the time, trying to cut it and narrow it and shave it down. How did people find that? Did you find that difficult? Yeah. I know. Very true. And also the, the thing about not waffling. Did anybody have a bit of the waffles going on? Anybody a waffler? Or do most people keep the keep the waffling down? The waffling was kept to a minimum? Well, <laughs> one or two people looking the other way. I I think, I mean, obviously, you know, like when we get our opportunities, we've got to take them. But I think it's just that thing where I've I've seen like we've got the chance with some people and then people I'm listening and they're waffling. I'm thinking, oh, man, this is a golden opportunity. And you're chatting about stuff that's easy to slice out. You know what I mean? You, we sometimes in our conversations, we go down little rabbit holes that... Actually, if you think about it, you, you didn't really need to say all of that. You could have cut that out and, like, get it down to that little. And and they say about, like, you know, speeches and everything and preaches, it's much more difficult to speak for a short time than it is a long time because we're long. You can just be like, do you know what I mean, and go around the houses. But to keep it really tight, it is very, very difficult. But we want to try and make the most of that opportunity now, it may be that you're brilliant for two minutes and then that gives you the opportunity because they might be like, oh, I really like that. I, I want to ask you some more stuff and you get a bit more time. But better for it to be like that than for them to be like, oh, man, how do I get away from this person? Do you know what I mean? Waving the flag of submission, saying you've got me, I don't want to stay. So I want to encourage you to invite and I want to encourage you to share your story and I want you to realize that all of us feel like we've got that nervousness about offending people you know somebody said to me recently I just don't want to be known as a bible basher and I understand that we don't want to we but it's that thing of like sometimes we worry about stuff that actually is not for us to worry about it's like hand that over to Jesus and be like, do you know what? Like, I want to give them the opportunity to hear. I've often said to people, you know, if you had the, the cure for cancer, you wouldn't be worried that people might misunderstand. Do you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't be worried that people might think, oh, that was a bit presumptuous. You would just want to tell everybody because you'd want to help people. And yet we've got the greatest, greatest story, the greatest truth. There's gospel. And then um, exactly USP. And I um, was in Glasgow speaking. And um, this is, this is on, some of you know my wife Tamsin. She's, you know, a great woman of God. But sometimes I wish the Holy Spirit would not 
speak through my wife. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, use someone else. God, please, talk through anyone, just not my wife. But the Lord, you. and what happened is I told you that I had that amazing event at Christmas and I was really buzzing and I, I came home and I told my kids and I told my wife, oh, this amount of people became a Christian. And my wife said this, she goes, oh, Mark, she goes, when was the last time you like actually spoke to somebody away from the microphone, away from your big stage, and actually witnessed to them one to one. When was the last time you did that? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, Lord, why? And uh, I was like, grumbling away. And the Lord was talking to me. And I thought, no, do you know what? He's right. And I was just recently, I was in Glasgow. And they put me up for the weekend and I was in a bed and breakfast and I was there having breakfast on the Sunday morning and uh, there was two other women in the inn having their breakfast and I felt the Lord like nudge me. I don't know if you, why does the Holy Spirit always have bony elbows? You know what I mean? He gets right in there, doesn't he? And he's like, you need to. And I'm like, no, and I've got all this stuff going on. I'm like, God, I can't just, what am I going to do? And I really felt, no, I need to do it. So I finished and I stood up and I went, oh, ladies. And you know that moment, she's like, oh, ladies. They're just like, ah, the heads move up. What is this man going to say now? It's like that moment, time is suspended. You're like, there, ah. And then I says, ladies, I says, like, I don't know what your plans are for today, but you know, I'm actually speaking at this church just down the road, just down the road and turn right, it's there. And I says, and it starts, and I told them the time, and I says, you know, it'd be amazing if you could come. I says, wouldn't it be brilliant? I'd love it if I got up to speak and you two were in the congregation. That would be amazing. And uh, all the time in my head, I'm going, this voice in my ear going, oh, you're so proud, you know, thinking that they would want to come to hear you speak. And I've got this ringing in my ears, and I'm like, no, keep going, keep going. And I says, no, no, I, honestly, it'll be a great message. It's a good church. You should come along. It's great music. You'll really love it. And the Bible says, well, do you know what? We've not got anything this morning. We're doing some stuff this afternoon. We might come. So I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe. And then I went up the stairs, and I was like really calm. I was like, oh, you know, bless you, bless you, great. And I went into my room, and I'm like, and then I heard them come up the stairs and walk along the corridor, and I was like, like following them in tongues, and uh, praying my heart. And basically, then I went to church on the Sunday, and when I got to speak, there they were. They were in the congregation. And one of the ladies responded and became a Christian. So I was like, wow. And, you know, I just want to encourage you that, you know, I had so many reasons for not speaking up. You know what I'm saying? I had so many things in my head saying, don't be daft. You're not going to do that, are you? In the breakfast room, what? Well, that's weird. But I actually thought, you know what? I want to give them the chance to say no. I want to give them the chance. What are they going to say? And they actually both said yes, and they came. So I want to encourage you. And, you know, I want to say, that really use this event that's coming up in April. Why don't you invite three people? Why don't you choose to say, I'm going to invite three people to this? And, you know, if none of them come, that's not failure. Yeah? It's not about whether they come or It's about the fact that you ask them. That's the success. The success is that you asked them. You invited them. And um, say it's going to be a fun event and it's going to be a lot of laughs and you should come along and, and then there'll be this opportunity for them to respond. So I wanted to, as we're coming towards the end, I wanted to, I wanted to just say that I heard this amazing story about a, a, a little boy that had gone missing in just outside London in, a, in one of the suburbs in a, in a village outside London. And it was a Friday night. And I found this amazing that everybody came back from their working week and everyone was getting ready. Some were going to go out into the city of London. Some were going to go and see an opera. Some were going to go out for meals. Some were going to go and have a drink. The village had all got their plans of what they were going to be doing. But then all of that changed because the dad running across the green, screaming and shouting, my son, I've lost my son. My son's gone missing. My son's gone. 
Now, I had this great idea that I thought would be brilliant, and I t told my wife, and she says, do not do that, right? Because what my idea was, that on the first week, last Thursday, uh, last Wednesday, sorry, I had this plan that I was going to start speaking, and I was going to have somebody with me that none of you would met. They were sitting in the car, and as I began to speak, they were going to come running in at the back and say, my son is missing. Would you help me look for my son? My son's gone. And of course, every one of us would get up and we'd all go, we've got to help this guy. And then we'd all get into the car park. And then I would say, oh, guys, it's only a drama. Actually, it's not real. Let's all go back in. And my wife was like, and then what would you do? And I says, and then I would unpack the amazing story of how we all got up and we left everything to go and find the kid. And she said, and they would all hate you, yeah? And they would all kind of like not hear another word that you said because they're still thinking about the fact that you got them all out in the car park. And I was like, yeah, actually, that is true. I'm not going to do that. But the idea was amazing because, you know, if somebody did come running in here and started shouting, oh, my son's lost, my little boy's gone, We'd all get up, wouldn't we? And we would do everything we could do to find that kid. And just in that village, the dad running across the field, my son, please, and people, forget the opera, forget the meals, forget going out for drinks, forget the theatre. We're going to try and find this kid. And you know, God comes to us now, and he says, my world's lost. My child's lost. You know, my sons and my daughters are lost. God is devastated at how this world slipped away from him. And he comes and he says to us in the church, please, will you help me find my lost ones? And you know, I want to say I am so encouraged that the leaders here have asked me to come and do these two sessions because that shows me that we've got in this church, we've got the heartbeat that we're saying to God, do you know what? Yes, we want to help you find the lost ones. We want to find this lost and broken generation. And it's so encouraging because I want to be honest with you, lots of churches, they're not doing evangelism classes. They're not trying to figure out how to win this world for God. They're just happy to kind of go on with their agenda and their church meetings and their services and all the programs. And meanwhile, the world is lost. And yet the church goes on, just putting on different programs, time. It's like, wow, God comes in and God's like saying, guys, my children are missing. My sons and my daughters are lost. And we respond and say, God, we drop everything. We want to make this a priority in our life. We want to do everything we can do. And you know, incredibly, everybody started searching in that village for that little lost boy. And they started looking everywhere. And they started and they had to work through the night, 11 p.m., midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. They're still out with their torches looking for this little boy. Incredible to think that they would do it through the night. And it's like, how, how much would we be willing to sacrifice to say, God, we, we want to we wanna find this lost generation. And we're willing to make sacrifices for that. Whatever it costs, Lord. Whatever it takes. I, I, I'll do it, Lord. I, I'm willing to do it because I want to see this generation found again. And it's like, you know, really incredibly in this story of this little lost boy. There's this moment where... Everyone's searching. It's like 3 a.m. And this guy just goes past. And there's under this little bush, he just sees these little fingers. 3 a.m. with his torch. And he stops. And he puts his torch. And there's a little boy under the bush. And I found this amazing that the little boy was shaking. And he said, ah, oh, I, I, I think my dad's going to be mad at me because I, I've run off. And, and the guy was like, no. Your dad's not going to be mad. Your dad's longing to see you. Your dad's been searching for you all night. He wants to be reunited with you. And the little boy's like, really? 
the dad's this the guy's like, yeah, your dad's been looking for you everywhere. And he kind of woos him out. And you know, I want to say that our job is that, you know, this broken and lost generation, they, a lot of them have got messed up ideas of what God is like and that God's angry with them and that, you know, God's... And we need to be the ones to say, no, 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 God's looking for you. Father wants to connect with you. God wants to be your friend. And we need to absolutely woo people out of that place of hidden. You know, it's like, um, I don't know if you've come across this ever, but people have weird ideas. I did a Christmas event a few years ago. And at the end, um, the, the pastor guy got up and said, listen, there's mince pies and, and uh, mulled wine in the back hall and everybody's welcome and did it. And everyone's, and I'm putting my stuff away and everybody gets up and goes into the back hall. And there's this one family and they just stay. And I'm putting my stuff in my bag and I'm chatting to a few people and I just see this family. So I go over to this family and I'm like, oh, hi, guys. You know, they were like, oh, that was great tonight. We loved it. I says, are you coming for mince pies and mulled wine? And they went, oh, no, 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 we're not. Because we're, um, we're, not, we're not members. We, 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 this is our first time we've ever come here. And I says, oh, no, no, but you can come. And they're like, oh, no, no, we're not signed up members. You've got to be a signed up member uh, to come to this church. And I was like, no, no, no. And I had to explain to them that it's not a golf club. You don't have to become a member. It's like, you know, everyone is welcome. And I took them through and got them sorted. And, you know, really unusual. Weird. But you see, the thing is, so many people out there, they've got all kinds of unusual things that they think happen in this room. They're like, oh, if I come, do I have to kind of, will I have to put my hands up in the air? Will I have to kneel down? They don't know. Like, and it's our job that we've got to woo people and say, no, you're welcome. Father God's looking for you. He's looking for you. He's longing to connect with you. And what an amazing story is that man found that little boy. And he helps him out from under the bush. And then he's, they start walking back towards the center of the village. And a shout goes across the village. He's been found. We found him. He's found. He's found. And then there's this amazing bit where the dad comes running across. And the little boy and the man said, what a privilege it was to be able to see the little boy run into the dad's arms and the dad grabbed hold of him and the dad was like you were lost but now you're found you're dead but now you're alive and it's like wow think of the privilege for us friends if we were there in that moment when we get the chance to see the lost come and be found in the arms of the father and you know that is what I'm wanting to pray as a, as we just finish. I want to pray that you know that we as a church we will see that moment where it's like we will see people come to faith. That we will see that this church will be a place where people will find that f sense of being with the Father again. They were lost, but now they're found. I was praying a few days ago for tonight and I was praying and saying, God, wouldn't it be amazing if like a businessman was to get saved in the town and come and, and wouldn't it be amazing if like a homeless guy got saved and was to come? Wouldn't it be brilliant if families were to come and, and, and get saved and, and we would see community turned around and we would see people sit in these chairs that were not here ever before and now they've come to faith and I know that's the heartbeat of the of the church leaders, but I really want to pray and believe that like salvation would spring up in this place, that we would really see those amazing stories. You know, I love the thought of that. I love the thought of that with a little boy and running in his dad's arms. And you know, that dad must have thought all kinds of things. He must have thought it's finished. My son's gone. Somebody's taken him. Bad things have happened. And then, no, he's there. I've found him. i found him. And I just want to pray in a minute that we will have these moments where 
I just want to believe that you're going to see young women that are going to be like, I, I found Father God in this church, in this place. I want to believe that we're going to have young guys with all their mess and all their stuff and all their complicated lives and all their complex needs and difficulties, but they're in here saying, oh, Father God found me here and I, I, I found God. Amen. And that we get the privilege, we get the privilege of being there to get the chance to see them run into the arms of the Father. You know, that's why I love what I'm doing. Somebody said to me a few weeks ago, they said, Mark, you've been an evangelist now for a lot of years, up and down that M1 a lot of times. And they said, how come you're still doing it? You still get up and you're going. And I'm like, because of the privilege, the privilege of being there. When people run into the arms of the Father, it's incredible. Just a couple of Sundays ago, I was there, and it's amazing. This guy, never been to church before, came for the first time, heard what I said, put his hand up, bawling his eyes out, comes to the front, found out that they're showing a service on YouTube, and said, I'm going back. My wife, my, not my wife, sorry, my partner, she's a, she's a Muslim and I'm going back this afternoon, and I've already told her we're going to have food, and then we're going to watch this Scottish guy again, and we're going to watch it. And I'm like, wow, you know, God, may that go well for him, and may, may that be a beautiful thing where people come into faith. What a privilege it is. And I just pray that we have that here, that we have men and women, young people, come to faith. In Jesus' name. So I wonder if, just as we're finishing, it's okay to ask you to stand and we're going to pray. And um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pray what's in my soul over you as a church. And I'm going to pray and believe that God is going to have many, many encounters with the lost. And we're going to see lots of people come back to the Father in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you that we've been talking these last couple of weeks about the lost being found and the lost coming back. And Father, I just want to pray that God, that the heartbeat of this church would be that we would just want to see many come to faith, many come to know you. I want to pray, Father, for young men and young women in this place called Blidworth. Come to faith in the name of Jesus. I want to pray, God, for men and women, for, for wives and for husbands. I want to pray for divorced men, for divorced women. I want to pray for split families. I want them all to find you, God. I want to pray for people who are in strong, good relationships. But I want to pray for those that are in broken and damaged relationships. I want to pray that everyone, Lord, would find you, Father, that the lost would come home. And we pray, God, for this event in April. We pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, there would be an anointing on it, that we would encourage us, embolden us to invite our world to it, Lord, that there would be people in the room that are not yet Christian that would hear the message of the cross in the name of Jesus. In your powerful name. I pray for Sunday mornings where we're preaching about, Lord, lots of different things. But the altar call goes out for the lost. That people would respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh
about voices.
day and night, day and night. Come on with one voice, day and night, day and night, night and day, let worship, oh, oh, let worship arise, day and night, night and day, let worship, day and night, day and night, night and day, let worship, oh, day and night, you were worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve it all. Come on, let's declare you are worthy, Lord. You're worthy of it. Let's lift up a shout of praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You were the Lord. Yeah, it's worthy of our praise. You know, God is worthy of it all. Mark, I just want to thank you for just sharing echo in the heart of this church, the heartbeat of this church. What we want to accomplish. Not for our glory, but for the glory of God. To see people's lives transformed, touched, restored, back into the family. To know that they're children of the living God. We have a desire to see that. We have a desire to see that. And to break through. To break through. To help people. See that. Be on a journey with them. Be with them. Give them time. Thanks again, Mark. It's been unbelievable. And with 15th is the date you need to get in your diary. 15th of April. 15th of April. You know, we're going to have a KFC or something, I'm sure. The food's <laughs> going to be top notch. Absolutely fantastic teaching. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for crossing the border and being with us. Two, two Wednesday nights. It's been fantastic. Thanks for the team and the worship and the team up on deck there. Thank you for your efforts and time and getting us online. For those that couldn't be with us tonight, they've seen it online. So that's been, been, been great news. Uh, it's fantastic to see you all coming out on a, a dark night. And it was raining when we set off, so it was fantastic. But, you know, you know I, can't, I can't say much more than Mark's already said. But, you know, it's down to us. Have that boldness and confidence to invite, to share our faith. I think last week you encouraged us to memorize scripture, didn't you? Mm. And I was thinking about when I was, might be put on the spot to share a three to four minute testimony, which most of you know that how difficult that would be for me. <laughs> I've decided that what we need to do in each one of those categories that Mark said is have a pre-prepared and thought about what I might say in either situation in that. Think about what I'm going to say in that situation. But hope that I'm on the lift in the Empire State Building. And I've got, <laughs> 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 and I've got 300 floors in order to get the <laughs> message across. But it's good to think about what our testimony and how we might share that in those circumstances, all right? Great to be with you. And uh, we'll see you all on Sunday, I'm sure. Give our love to Liz and Mike back at Ollerton. We appreciate you coming out and coming this way. Uh, we're not inviting you on the 15th, but <laughs> <laughs> just keep the 15th in mind. <laughs> Have you? Oh, cut back on. Where's Mark? Cut back on the lasagnas then, Mark. <laughs> but great, but thank you so much for taking time, being with us and sharing yeah. with us. And, uh, you know, we're into... We're all one church. We're all about just seeing people in whichever community they're in coming to know God.
No, it's a real privilege. Thanks, guys. Bless you. I feel like it's a Sunday I was going to do the blessing over you, but I'm not quite sure that's appropriate. Or not. <laughs> Lord, bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you Sunday. We'll see you all Sunday. Amen.